In Los Angeles alone, it's estimated that there are 60,000 gang members responsible for a full third of that city's homicides. And over the years, no gang has received more attention than the Crips, and no gangster has become more notorious than Cody Scott. For nearly two decades, the tattooed, bullet-scarred veteran of L.A.'s gang wars robbed, mugged, and murdered his way to the top ranks of the gang underworld, earning the nickname Monster Cody for his distinctive brand of brutality. Now he subdued the literary world with a memoir that some have compared to the autobiography of Malcolm X and Eldridge Cleaver's Soul on Ice. He is handsome, bright, and articulate, but he won't be making the rounds of the talk shows or book parties. Back up, I'm on the door. Face the wall over here. He is presently occupied at the Pelican Bay State Prison, the Devil's Island of the California penal system, where he's serving a seven-year sentence for robbery and assault, indisposed to all but carefully screened guests. Escort, coming in. He spends 22 and a half hours a day in solitary confinement, where he wrote his autobiography with a prison issue pencil. According to the show business daily Variety, his New York literary agents, Janklow and Nesbitt, sold it for a quarter of a million dollars. And now, Hollywood mogul Michael Ovitz's agency is peddling the movie rights. This book is 383 pages of killings, stabbings, beatings, drive-by shootings, revenge killings. At one point, um, you amputate the arms of a rival gang member. Explain that to me. This book is 383 pages of reality. I'm uniquely qualified to write 383 pages of life for this generation, and that's what I've done. So it's 383 pages of gore, no doubt about that, but it's reality. It happens every day. In Monster's case, it was everything from carjacking to robbery to murder, with names, dates, and places altered slightly in the book to protect the guilty. The Los Angeles Times called him a walking, stalking, incarcerated end product of America's assault on the black psyche. The New York Times praised the book as a raw and frightening portrait of gang life. Where I lived, we grew and died in dog years. Actually, some dogs outlived us. Where I lived, stepping on someone's shoe was a capital offense, punishable by death. The underlying factor that usually got you killed was the principle. The principle is respect, a linchpin critical to relations between all people, but magnified by 30 in the ghettos and slums across America. Are you proud of these words? I'm proud of the words, yes. Not necessarily the deeds, but I'm proud of the words. What was your reaction when you saw the New York Times review? I kind of jumped around the cell a bit, you know. First time I've ever been recognized by a civilian for something other than aggression, naked aggression. Is that important to you, to be recognized by civilians? This is not for recognition, it's, 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 it's the truth, you know? Somebody has to speak about it. Somebody has to say something. This was the center of Monster Cody's existence, one small violent part of Los Angeles, the corner of Florence and Normandy, where last year's riots broke out. He grew up just a few blocks from here, and this is the neighborhood where he made his reputation with the eight Trey Gangsters, a violent, predatory faction of the Crips, one battalion in the Los Angeles Gang Wars. He joined the Crips at age 11 on the day he graduated from the sixth grade. That night, he says he was given a shotgun, and for his initiation, he pumped eight rounds into the ranks of a rival gang. Why would an 11-year-old want to carry a gun and go out and kill people? It was necessary. It was either I got with the power or I was a victim. Either you get with it or you don't. It's pressure, peer pressure. It's normal. And this is normality. There's no measuring stick for normality where we live. And so whatever happens to be the trend at that particular time, which was shooting people, was the normal thing to do. It, it didn't matter that I was 11. You know, it, I could have been nine. I want to read you something that you wrote. My participation in the gangs came as second nature. To be in a gang in South Central when I joined, and it's still the case today, is the equivalent of growing up in Gross Point, Michigan and going to college. Everyone does it. Everyone does it. And those who don't are considered weak because now we have a measuring stick. And the measuring stick is to be in, to be a gunfighter, to be a fighter. You know, that, that's the measuring stick of manhood in our community now, as was the case then. 
What did you like about the people that were in the Crips in your neighborhood? The power they seemed to wield. They had this, this, this allure. They were free. See, you had two classes. You had the victims and you had the assailants. And the assailants always seemed to be my heroes because they seemed to come away victorious every time. It would become his career, his calling, as he wrote in the book, not some awkward stage of his life, but a job. At 15, he was arrested for assault. A year later, he was shot six times in an ambush. He survived to become a general with the title OG, original gangster, a full-fledged ghetto star. Do you have any idea how many people you've killed? No. No, I don't even know. I wonder how many people Oliver North killed. I don't know. Or Norman Schwarzkopf. He's a hero, isn't he? I, I don't know. I don't know. But you remember doing it. Yeah, no doubt about it. I was engaged in the war, and the rules of engagement were kill or be killed, you know? You say it's a war. Who are the sides? Who's fighting who? Over what? It's a war actually for nothing other than the destruction of human beings. The, the, the end result is to create funerals. As many soldiers as you can drop on the other side is considered um, success. And um, with, the, with the dropping of bodies, the pushing out of people, you, um, you get a reputation, which is like the pinnacle. And you climb the ladder, just as, any, as in any other organization or corporation or army or anything that's, you climb a ladder. And that's, that becomes your goal. To win respect. To win respect. Why respect? Because there's no objective respect coming from, quote unquote, um, society. So when you don't feel respect, you create what, what is respect to you. The lines at that He had a lot more going for him than most of his peers. He was raised by his mother, Bertie Scott, in a modest but comfortable section of South Central Los Angeles. It doesn't fit the stereotype. I mean, it's nice lawns, people take care of their houses, looks like a working class neighborhood. Yes. No drive-by shootings? No, never. His biological father, according to Bertie, is Dick Bass, the former NFL running back for the Los Angeles Rams. His godfather was Ray Charles, a family friend. I'd like to think that had I not had to work three jobs, two jobs, I could have spent a little more time and maybe he would not have become a monster. Did you try and stop him? Of course. I tried everything. Cub Scouts, I went. Child Guardians, everything that I could reach out and try and get a hold of just to get some help, some kind of help. Uh, it just couldn't come fast enough because there were too many of the children that were having the same kind of problem, parents having the same kind of problem, and there were too many people ahead of my little guy. And as time was moving on, he was moving on. So there was just no help. I want to read you something from the book. I enjoyed being Monster Cody. I live for the power surge of playing God, having the power of life and death in my hands. <sighs> wow. He obviously liked it. He did. And he was good at it. He was that kind of person. Whatever he decided to do, he was going to do it well. He always wanted to do better than anyone else, always. You don't have most of the usual excuses. You didn't grow up in the projects. Uh, you had a very strong mother. Your biological father is Absent, absent, an NFL, in action. an NFL football player. But, yeah, I, I hear you. Your godfather's Ray Charles. Yeah, 
But while my mother's at work being a working class woman, while my father was on the football field, while Ray was in the recording studio, I was in the street. You know what I mean? I was being influenced by social forces that they couldn't even touch, couldn't even understand. And uh, my mother couldn't protect me from that. Ray couldn't come get me all the time. And, and Dick couldn't, never came, but, um, you, know, you know what I mean? So, do you resent that? To a great extent, no doubt about it, I hate him. You know what I mean? I hate him because I, I, I think about what I could have been, you know? And um, I can't dig that, man. You're running out of your kids, you know? You know, father thing, man. But um, that's just heavy to me now, you know? This is heavy. Would it have made a difference, do you think? Yeah, because uh, I wouldn't have to go to the street to find the street people, you know? To find, uh, you know, people in the street, you know? He says he's put that life behind him. He's adopted the African name Sanika Shakur, unifier of people. And now, through his writing, wants to help put an end to gang violence. I like the pen better than the weapon, actually, now, because I know I can reach more people. And I'm not into destruction for destruction's sake. Not everyone buys it, certainly not Bambi Moyer, the prosecutor in Riverside County, California, who last put Monster away. How would you describe Cody Scott? I would almost say that he is chameleon-like because of the fact that when he was in court, he was extremely calm, extremely respectful, He's a bright guy. He is not uh, dumb. Extremely intelligent. And I think extremely entrenched in the gang lifestyle. That is his life. A hardcore killer. Mm -hmm. I think Cody Scott would, uh, would kill you just as soon as he would shake your hand. One of the prosecutors who put you here yeah. told us that you were the perfect sociopath somebody who was able to use their brains and their charm to manipulate people in society. Hmm. Sounds like Robert Doe, doesn't it? Um, hmm. Sociopath. That's heavy. No, I don't think so. I'm, I'm a regular cat. You know what I mean? I'm a regular person. You're not a regular person to most people. You've shot people, you've killed people. I've had an eventful life. Do you feel any respect to, allegiance for, the city of Los Angeles, the state of California, the United States of America? Not one iota. I'm not even a citizen of America. I'm a citizen of the People's Republic of New Africa. And, um, no, I don't... America is... No. He says he's renounced gang violence, but now he's embraced a radical black separatist cause that some consider even more dangerous. According to Monster, that's why he's in Pelican Bay. I'm what they call an organizer, an agitator. And when I transformed from being a crip to being a revolutionary, I became a threat. Are Just, you a threat? Apparently, I'm in solitary confinement sitting here in chains. Apparently, someone thinks I'm a threat. With two armed guards right yeah, next to you. This is... is a college to me. I'm training in revolutionary science. I'm locked in my cage and using what I have to get what I want. So when I get out, I may be an upstanding quote unquote citizen, being that I won't commit crime because I'm not a criminal. But every day of my life will be working towards the independence of my people. So I won't rob nobody. I won't sell crack. I won't shoot nobody that doesn't deserve to be shot. I won't commit an act where the police will have to come looking for me because it's not the type of thing with me anymore. Escort. It's not just me, but a generation of people who have lost their way. There's a multitude of monsters out there. I just happen to be the one to come and articulate the position. Monster's book is out now. Monster himself will be out in 1995.